11 o'clock. We're getting ready to start uh, our program. Um, I'm going to uh, give people um, a little bit of time uh, to uh, join us, uh, but the numbers do seem to be uh, um, jumping up right away. Uh, and so we'll uh, give people a few minutes to log in with us. <clears throat> And we'll start some introductions and get cooking. Hopefully, we'll have a really good um, a really good turnout. The registration was quite high, although I know a lot of people want access to recording because the timing of, of webinars is not always great. More and more people are doing something around lunchtime. But then if everybody wants to do something around lunchtime, <laughs> there's only so many lunchtimes available. <clears throat> okay. So, hello, we have our attendee back from Dublin, Ireland. Yes, happy Valentine's Day to you too, Edward. <clears throat> okay. People another minute or so, and we'll dig in. Ooh, Brussels, Belgium. Hmm. Wow. So nice you could join us, even with the time difference. Okay, so uh, let's uh, dig in uh, and uh, get started. Uh, for any of you who haven't been in my programs before, um, uh, my name is Nellie Brown. Um, I direct the Workplace Health and Safety Program, which is part of Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations Outreach Division. I'm also part of the Buffalo Collaborative Project as well, or CoLab as we call it. <laughs> I'm a certified industrial hygienist, so health and safety is so what I do. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by two of my colleagues. Uh, Veronica Moore will be handling the Q&A, so please, if you have questions, put them into Q&A so that she can uh, keep track of them more easily uh, rather than using uh, both the Q&A and the chat. It's much easier. She can just look at one place. Um, and uh, remember, I can't see a raised hand uh, when uh, I'm showing my slides. So, uh, do put uh, your concerns into the Q&A so that uh, Veronica can address them. I'm also joined uh, by my colleague, Stephanie uh, Olszewski, uh, who is also assisting uh, with um, the um, uh, connections and uh, making sure our technology works, which is always so very important. So today's program uh, is the sixth in our health and safety series that I've been giving for our Worker Institute uh, here at Cornell ILR. Uh, and uh, we're gonna be talking today about a problem solving uh, technique called the hierarchy of controls. So I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen and uh, we'll begin our program. Okay. <clears throat> I thought it would be a useful um, workshop uh, to do for uh, everyone uh, is to look at this problem solving technique called the hierarchy of controls uh, that is built into, of course, a lot of our OSHA standards. Um, it's built uh, into a lot of our recommendations of NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And uh, it helps us to stimulate, I think, creativity uh, and looking at um, the most powerful control measures we can, uh, and then uh, looking at um, alternatives uh, when uh, some things just uh, don't uh, turn out to be feasible. So uh, to get started, um, I'm going to be uh, reviewing generally what we mean by the hierarchy, if it's uh, new to you. Um, along with um, a variety of the different kinds of controls, uh, there's a lot of different possibilities here, depending, of, of course, on uh, what sort of hazard 
uh, or hazards we're addressing. And then I'm going to work uh, through several categories of hazard uh, and give you uh, examples of how you might uh, use the uh, hierarchy uh, to address those. Now, it's sort of a truism in the field of occupational safety and health that we think it should be possible to work with anything safely, of course, given uh, the proper procedures and controls. And generally speaking, that's the real trick, isn't it? I mean, let's face it, uh, people are able to actually work on Chernobyl uh, with the proper procedures and controls, but we know things uh, can be, of course, uh, uh, problematic. They can be, have very uh, uh, significant feasibility issues, very high costs associated with them, sometimes very high levels of training and expertise needed to do uh, these different things. And so uh, it's uh, not always uh, as simple uh, as to say, well, uh, we should be able to just do this uh, if we throw enough money at it or whatever, but sometimes it's more difficult than you might imagine. And sometimes the ideal technology just isn't there yet. So this is what the hierarchy of controls looks like um, uh, as uh, um, put together by uh, NIOSH, uh, our National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, which is a part of our uh, US Department of Health and Human Services. Now the hierarchy is a hierarchy because we want to start at the top uh, we believe that at the top of the hierarchy, there is the most powerful hazard uh, reduction method possible. Uh, and then if that turns out to be uh, insufficient or not feasible, then we drop down to the next uh, rung on the hierarchy and so on. Now, it is also true that we often will use several items on the hierarchy that we, 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 want, we may want some of several different ones of these. And uh, as a result, they all work together uh, to uh, reduce uh, our um, uh, hazard and risk, uh, and that's also desirable as well. <clears throat> so starting at the top of the hierarchy, by elimination, we mean we're actually getting rid of the hazard altogether. Uh, and uh, in some cases, as I'll show you uh, examples, uh, it is possible to actually do that. Um, the way, for example, that we uh, may actually be able uh, to decide that a particular um, a process or whatever simply uh, is just not uh, one that we want to continue we're going to eliminate it altogether. <clears throat> Sometimes our elimination um, uh, ideas are just not 100%. The way, for example, in our current pandemic, uh, we are trying wherever possible uh, to uh, prevent a disease uh, using things like vaccination, uh, doing uh, testing of people, um, and checking for symptoms and so on. But as we've learned, each of those has its limits and the elimination is not really 100%, although we can do some pretty good jobs with these different controls, but it's not quite 100% elimination. Now, the next rung on the hierarchy is substitution. Sometimes we can replace uh, whatever the process or uh, chemical or issue is uh, with uh, a different one uh, where the hazards or risks are a lot less. <clears throat> uh, the way, for example, that we may uh, be able to find a safer chemical to do a particular job and maybe avoid a carcinogen uh, by replacing it instead with uh, something that's only an irritant. Or uh, enable controls to be better uh, by changing something that uh, is uh, the use of a flammable material uh, to something that <clears throat> is instead uh, water-based uh, so that we eliminate the uh, fire hazard by doing the substitution, but uh, the water-based material still has its own hazards. So it's not as though we've, we've gotten rid of everything uh, that is risky but we have indeed uh, done quite a bit to reduce our level of risk. Now, of course, if that's not possible, uh, we have a process, we have a chemical, whatever it is we're doing, uh, there is no uh, alternative for it. This is what we have to be doing, or this is how we make our living is doing this, <laughs> uh, then uh, we can drop down to engineering controls. Now, engineering controls are described here as uh, ways that we isolate people from the hazard. Uh, and uh, we can think of these in several ways. Sometimes we can actually enclose a process the way someone might uh, completely enclose uh, a piece of uh, metal working equipment like a broaching machine. Uh, and as a result, uh, all the uh, aerosols from the uh, uh, metal working fluids, for example, are completely contained. Uh, and uh, this, uh, any pieces of metal swarf that might fly around are completely contained. And the person is outside that containment uh, operating uh, the uh, process uh, by a computer. Uh, and yes, we can sometimes do that uh, or put up a barriers or shields uh, of various kinds uh, in front of people uh, to protect them. We do machine guarding and it works like that. 
uh, we apply ventilation and so on. And we'll look at a number of examples of these. We also include our workflow here, uh, often the design or layout uh, of a process, how the steps connect to each other can be very important. Now, if that is not sufficient, or maybe we've installed uh, ventilation, but uh, it's uh, not able to reduce exposure low enough uh, to meet uh, our, either a particular standard or particular need, uh, then we uh, can uh, apply other things as well. Now, when we drop down to the next rung of the hierarchy, administrative controls, we're now dealing with the interaction of people. We're changing the way people work. And you know as well as I do, humans are creatures of habit. It is not easy to make us change the way we do things. But here in the administrative controls, we're talking about the way we train people and then expect them to carry out what we've trained them to do. Uh, we put in place all kinds of standard job operating procedures and work practices and expect people to carry them out. Uh, we put in place preventive maintenance and expect those things to get done and so on. And we include in here things like job rotation as well. Now, the last rung on the hierarchy is personal protective equipment, PPE. And of course, this may be the best choice. Uh, if we need to keep people mobile, uh, sometimes the only alternative is PPE. But sometimes it adds an extra layer to some of the other things we've put in place. Uh, and as a result, uh, we're able to get additional protection. But this protection, of course, is put on the individual and protects that person. And these are going to depend on the nature of the hazard. Uh, for example, we might be putting uh, on a person a respiratory protection for an inhalation hazard. Uh, we might be putting a hearing protection on. Uh, we might be wearing gloves, protective clothing of all kinds. And then, of course, we're faced with the need to address how we uh, care for that protective uh, equipment and clothing how we decontaminate it, is it disposable? Does it even need to be destroyed? Uh, so yes, a lot of considerations here as well. So oftentimes we still end up providing training even though um, the control measures are on some other layer of the hierarchy. Uh, and we need to support changes we make in the workplace of any kind, often with considerable amounts of training to support it. Now, I think before we uh, start deciding on going through the hierarchy for our particular hazard, there are some things we should find out at this point in order to make some good decisions. First of all, we need to know what are the job tasks that we're actually addressing here and what their hazards are. And uh, I'll go through the hazards briefly in another slide. Uh, what parts of the body are affected? And when we have someone doing a particular job, in what way uh, are they at risk? So we need to figure that out. Uh, if it's a case where someone has exposure to something entering the body through some type of route of entry, a point of contact with the eyes and skin or entering the body through uh, inhalation, for example, or even ingestion, we would want uh, to be able to uh, understand what that route of entry is. And I do tend to find that sometimes people forget that ingestion is also a route of entry. A lot of times, you know, if you're working in a dusty environment or one with a lot of aerosol droplets in the air, putting respiratory protection on someone automatically covers their lips. That prevents them from licking their lips and eating whatever it is that landed on those lips. So sometimes you get two routes of entry blocked with one, uh, one piece of PPE. But sometimes when you're dealing with ingestion, you're dealing with habits. How people, of course, wash their hands. Do they recognize when they need to do that? And sometimes people have ingestion as a route of entry you would never suspect. As for example, in a workplace where people had exposure to powdered lead, lead dust of all kinds was all over the place. When the facility was sold, uh, the, um, the new uh, owner uh, put in all kinds of controls right off the hierarchy. Lots of great encapsulation of processes, local exhaust ventilation, improvements to housekeeping. And you could see as these controls were put in place, people's blood lead levels progressively came down and down. However, in two of the employees, the blood lead levels did not drop. Well, the employer went uh, to look at this. He hired an, an industrial hygienist to do a job hazard analysis. What did the industrial hygienist find? Well, in one man's workstation, he had under his workbench a shelf, which had a little bowl of hard candy in it, little candies wrapped in cellophane, and they were covered in dust 
Sure enough, the man would grab a piece of candy, unwrap it, put it in his mouth, and eat the lead dust off his fingers. What about the other coworker? Well, he worked at the next workstation over, and every so often, he was stealing this man's candy. Now, when we think about uh, understanding uh, the nature of hazards and exposure, we should pay attention to how that hazard might be affected by the layout of the workplace or the job location. Where exactly are people in relation to each other? Might they be exposing each other by the fact that one person may be in proximity to a process, it's not one they're doing, but they're affected by it. The way, for example, a laborer working next to a welder on a bridge uh, doing repairs is exposed to the fumes of the welding. The welder might have been fitted with a respirator because the assumption was he's a welder, he needs respiratory protection. But the laborer's title was not welder, it was laborer. And as a result, no one thought about the fact he was working right next to someone who was in fact generating hazards. The job location, are people in a building? Are they outside? Are they in the field? Does the very nature of their location make a difference? The way, for example, someone might need to do confined space entry in a manhole located in the middle of a busy street. And now we have to address the issue of traffic. How is the location affected by the location of coworkers specifically? I always tend to think of one workplace I was in where I was evaluating uh, different jobs and people were in such tight proximity to each other that as one person literally used a shovel to clean out the bottom of one metalworking machine that he worked on, he was literally hitting the next coworker over with the back of the shovel. <laughs> so yes, sometimes what people are doing affects each other quite obviously. Now we also should learn from past mistakes. You know, anytime we've had past injuries or accidents, we've paid a high price for information. It would be foolish not to pay attention to that. Yet you'd be surprised some people uh, in workplaces are not given hard hats, even though other people in that same workplace have been hit by flying items that a hard hat would have made a big difference. They didn't learn from those prior injuries. Now, I always tend to think one of the nicest pieces of information you could ever have is the information you get by having people report near misses, what some workplaces like to call a good catch. And what we mean by this is we got the information by people reporting this, but we didn't have to pay the accompanying price if the actual accident or injury had physically occurred. And so the idea of encouraging information working its way into your organization to people who can make a difference about it. To me, anytime you get information and you didn't have to pay a price in human suffering, or of course in money as well, uh, makes a huge difference for us. Okay, now when I tend to think of evaluating a workplace for hazards, uh, I tend to think of these kinds of categories. So when I look at a job, I want to see what exactly is going on here that might have this person affected. Uh, are they exposed in any way to a chemical? And keep in mind, for chemicals, we're talking about reactive hazards like flammability or being an oxidizer, for example, as well as the health hazards these exposures could occur. <clears throat> now, uh, we may have a workplace with biological exposures, people exposed to diseases, people exposed to organisms that uh, could uh, produce uh, allergic reactions in them. And of course, uh, you know, this can vary enormously in workplaces. And sometimes the infections or inflammations that people get uh, may even be related to the fact the organisms are dead, but they still can produce allergy. They still might have endotoxins on their surface and so on. And in some workplaces, the issue is indeed infestation with what I will politely call critters of various kinds. <clears throat> Now, the issue could be uh, also that people come in contact with poisons in ways that you might not always think about. A lot of times in workplaces, people are exposed to poisonous plants. They're exposed to contaminated materials, such as metalworking fluids that might have um, uh, fungi or bacteria growing in them. So biological can actually be quite a wide range of possibilities. Now, ergonomic issues, we tend to think of these strains and sprains and overexertions, whether they occur as either acute or cumulative. Now, occupational stress is a pretty broad umbrella, uh, but I like to include when I think about the stresses that people report uh, or experience, 
Now we also include things like shift work and shift designs, the scheduling of people, they're working of long hours or overtime, especially if that overtime is mandatory. So there are a lot of ways that people can experience stress. And some of them, of course, are interpersonal as well. Uh, people are harassed or bullied in the workplace or they're subject to uh, various kinds of uh, discrimination and so on. Now in the physical category, there are a variety of possibilities here. Radiation, which could be ionizing or non-ionizing. It could be thermal stresses like extremes of heat and cold. It could be EMF, electromagnetic fields. It could be vibration or, of course, noise. Now, of course, noise is vibration. The real issue or distinction we make between the two is vibration if we can feel it and noise if we can hear it, but they're all vibrations. <laughs> now, trauma, of course, is usually one of the first things we tend to think of. Can people be physically injured? Might they have a slip or fall? And might they have some kind of impact or something swing around, fly at them? Uh, could they be in a compression injury where they're uh, caught between items uh, and squashed? Did something roll over their foot? Um, can they be uh, literally crushed in equipment? Mm -hmm. uh, can they be in some way cut, uh, bruised, or of course, the extremes of amputation as well? But the violence category is quite wide. Here, we're including everything from a verbal uh, uh, harassment and threats all the way through uh, to uh, physical assaults and, of course, uh, homicide. And there are occasions when people actually do commit a suicide in the workplace as well. <clears throat> now, the last category, indoor air quality, is what we uh, call uh, the uh, indoor environment, but in the non-industrial workplace. So this is really workplaces we tend to think of as very clean, uh, low exposure kinds of things like an office environment, uh, a school, a bank, um, places we tend to think of as very low hazard. But uh, the reality is that uh, there are issues within the indoor environment which can make a big difference. Uh, and we have become, of course, even more cognizant of the indoor environment uh, through the current pandemic as well. Okay. So the top rung of the hierarchy, hazard elimination, is where I think I'd like to see people being as creative as possible. For example, uh, when uh, I began uh, doing training years and years ago on confined space entry, I'm a former licensed wastewater treatment plant operator, so uh, I'm accustomed to confined spaces at that end of the pipe, as we say, uh, but um, <clears throat> what I like to uh, encourage people to do in relation to confined spaces is to think about hazard elimination here. Uh, is it possible to get whatever the task that needs to be done in that space done without entry at all? For example, do we have to send someone inside the tank to clean it? Could we do some form of pressure washing from the outside? If our real intent was to go into that tank to do an inspection, could we instead use a drone to do that for us. Okay, so let's look at some hazard categories generally and some ideas of how we might apply the hierarchy of controls there. I'm gonna start out looking at the issue of workplace violence. Okay, well, hazard elimination ideas. Some workplaces have simply said, well, the big problem for us is sending people out into the field uh, and so what we're going to do is simply curtail that work. We're going to decide now that there will be no on-site field work. Everything will be done in some way remotely, using remote sensors, doing some form of uh, electronic monitoring. Uh, maybe we have uh, some type of uh, remote operated equipment that we could use. But however we're going to do it, we're just not having people go on site anymore or for people who are make, uh, in the uh, history of making um, uh, home visits for medical treatment, but there are some types of uh, diagnostic work which can be done through electronic monitoring of a patient rather than doing a home visit. Uh, for example, there is a, a, a equipment you can use for monitoring uh, EKG, uh, temperature, things like that, um, which uh, can in fact be done remotely uh, and it does not require a person to go into the field uh, directly uh, encountering uh, the patient. Um, and uh, this, again, uh, reduces a lot of the risks of confrontation. 
And sometimes people are very angry about uh, individuals coming into their home or onto their property. And a lot of times people making home visits have been threatened uh, and have had guns uh, leveled at them and so on. Now, what about uh, a policy on dogs? Uh, one of the uh, situations that I have uh, seen happen with uh, healthcare workers, with social workers making field visits, uh, is that uh, they ring the doorbell and a dog begins barking quite loudly. Well, it's useful to have a policy which simply says, you can tell the owner to restrain the dog. I could put them in a, in a separate room with the door closed, whatever. And if the owner is not able to restrain it, you reschedule the home visit for another time so that you do not face the issue of the dog. Now, of course, uh, dog owners will be the first to tell you, my dog is a sweetheart and he would never bite anybody. Unfortunately, if you are uh, the person uh, needing to take a blood sample from someone or give someone an injectable medication and the person experiences pain, it's not surprising to find the dog acting defensive. This is their nature and is often the reason why we want to have dogs. But and the idea that uh, they never bite is actually not really true. Sometimes if an owner is believed to be uh, threatened in some way, the dog will still bite, to bite, despite the fact that they have a history of being very mild-mannered or very old and decrepit. Okay, what about engineering controls to address workplace violence prevention? Well, uh, we have a lot of use, of course, of cameras and remote monitoring uh, for various areas. Um, or being able to view someone before we uh, unlock a door and allow them into a facility. Increased lighting has done dramatic differences. And this is both interior and exterior lighting. Parking lots can be made a great deal safer when people can see what's ahead of them. Uh, and uh, with a lot of lighting, it's more difficult for a, a potential perpetrator to hide in shadows. Designing secure building access and making sure it's adhered to. Unfortunately, I have seen uh, ways that people come up with to defeat this kind of problem. Uh, for example, I had uh, a building I needed to do a site visit in, but uh, I had uh, a whole cartload of equipment I needed to bring with me to do that. And uh, the only real way I could get in with that cartload of equipment was to use the loading ramp. Unfortunately, the loading door was something that people kept propped open uh, with a piece of wood because they wanted to be able to get out and grab a smoke uh, or they um, simply didn't want to have to keep um, answering the door for deliveries and they simply left it uh, unsecured in that way. So yes, everyone thought we have great security for our building, but that's not in practice what was actually happening. And in some places that I've been into, uh, the door is supposed to automatically lock uh, when it closes but the door doesn't close all the way, it simply stays ajar. So unless the person entering makes sure that door closed behind them, the, the, again, the security is being defeated. There's all kinds of security hardware, of course, available. I won't get into all these kinds of designs, but ways we can buzz people into buildings, uh, ways we can use uh, all kinds of uh, ID badge uh, interactions with computer software. There's a lot of stuff going on with that. Now, <clears throat> uh, eliminating isolated work areas. And this is what some workplaces have chosen to do. Uh, they take a look at the layout of their workplace and they make sure that no one truly is working alone. Uh, there is some way that person can uh, some way be observed by others. Um, a, a couple of people are an easy uh, a line of sight with each other but some way to work this out. <clears throat> now, um, in some places, uh, people have simply said, look, our, our biggest risk here really is robbery. So what we're going to do uh, is eliminate uh, any uh, way that we might serve as a potential target for robbery. We won't keep a lot of cash on hand and we'll post signs indicating that. Or we'll say that, the, um, that we have a drop sap, a safe on the premises and no one has access to it. So it's useless to come in and hold someone at gunpoint on the idea that they can open a safe or get access to the cash register or something like that because that's not physically possible. For some workplaces, one of the nicest uh, things that staff uh, uh, have uh, really preferred 
is to have a lockable restroom for staff. That way, other restrooms that are available to the public or to visitors um, are kept open, but the staff have their own. Believe it or not, restrooms are a place where a potential perpetrator would like to hide uh, and uh, await a, a potential victim. So yes, a lot of attention has been paid to the designs of these. Uh, and you may have noticed the last time, perhaps you were at an airport, that oftentimes the uh, wall uh, uh, that uh, you want to get into uh, the entrance to a restroom is there's literally a wall and you kind of walk around it so that once you enter the restroom, you have a good view of what the restroom looks like. Now, if we drop down to administrative controls, we're now relying on things that people have to carry out. So we might be looking at staffing levels. That way enough people are present in a workplace that it creates the illusion of security. Perpetrators are less likely to think people are vulnerable uh, if there are always people around. <laughs> uh, no one is really by themselves looking very vulnerable. Uh, the employment, of course, of uh, personnel for the purposes of security. Uh, developing various building access control procedures and how people then carry those out. Uh, having good cross-shift communication where people can uh, share information regarding an agitated client uh, or patient, for example, who is still uh, on the premises. And you can uh, basically interact with each other and say, well, you know, this person has been pretty difficult today. Here's what we've been doing so far. So when I hand this person over to you, this is what we uh, can expect here. The idea of having a buddy system for people who go out into the field. So no one is truly working alone. In one uh, kind of workplace, uh, they began to institute something that has now been spread around quite a bit. And that's the elimination of long customer wait lines. Uh, the ability to give sometimes people specific appointments this way. Uh, or having more uh, um, staff available to handle customers at very popular times when customers are likely to arrive. And the value is this, is that this is people don't get so impatient, they get angry, uh, they get uh, tired of waiting, uh, and they start to doing uh, sometimes nasty things. Uh, they get uh, threatening um, language, of course, uh, happens here, or, or people, uh, you know, just uh, basically start acting out, kicking furniture and whatever. Now, the provision of personal alarms has happened in some workplaces. People like these a lot, uh, where they can alert to someone nearby to their predicament. Um, providing for cell phones for field workers, making sure you can always keep good tabs with people. Uh, some uh, workplaces even gone to GPS for that as well. Uh, and, of course, training. We can train people on conflict resolution skills, of course, even the best communication skills can't de-escalate all situations. Uh, training people and what you expect of them in an emergency. Sometimes we simply expect people to get up and leave and that's it. Just look after yourself, just go. <laughs> but for others, we expect them to shut down pieces of equipment, make sure certain doors are locked. You know, what is it you actually expect people to do depending on what the problem is? And of course, for some workplaces, they have decided they're simply going to use the FEMA model of run, hide, fight. In other words, if a situation develops, get out if you can. If you can't, hide, turn off lights, get in a closet, a cupboard, anything uh, that makes a place look like it's unoccupied so no one will come in it, come in there and after you. And uh, if uh, you can't do that and trouble is coming at you, look around for potential weapons. Those might be scissors on a desk, a letter opener, and maybe even you grab the fire extinguisher off the wall and be prepared to slug someone with it. <clears throat> the last item on the hierarchy of controls may not necessarily be an option for a lot of us. Yes, we can say that there are such things as bulletproof vests and body armor, but for so many of our workplaces, this is not what we're going to be wearing. Uh, I, I always got a, a bit of a humor out of people saying it's the kind of protective equipment you'd wear if you were going to have to give your cat a bath. Yes, definitely body armor for that one and a good face shield. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, there are some things we can give to people, but of course, 
At this end of the hierarchy, their effectiveness may not be that great, but they do exist. Uh, yes, we can use ID badges. We can tell who is the outsider, who is one of us. Uh, and depending upon the nature of those ID badges, sometimes those give us access to more private areas and that can be very helpful. People can get refuge and be less uh, uh, exposed by being able to get to more remote uh, areas within a facility. The use of personal alarms sometimes at this level uh, may be uh, only uh, an issue that it might uh, scare someone away who's uh, coming at you. That might be a possibility here, especially if there's nobody in the area where your personal alarm could truly alert someone to come and help you the way it might have done further up on the hierarchy. And of course, again, our use of cell phones, again, uh, where we can uh, uh, you know, request help and so forth, but uh, how soon can it reach us and how useful is that? Uh, but sometimes you know, these things can be a fallback position. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about the hazard of ergonomics? Well, <clears throat> elimination has been tried in many workplaces. They've gone to simply a zero lift policy, as they call it, on the idea that there are certain lifts we simply forbid. And that's why we're going to eliminate this particular problem. Uh, and we basically say in these situations, there are other things that we will be doing, but lifting absolutely is forbidden. Well, can't always do much in the way of substitution there, but we can drop down to some really good engineering controls. And it's become kind of a truism uh, in uh, the field of ergonomics that we often say, if you have a, a particular kind of situation where you have to do any kind of lift, lower or carry as part of your job, we should replace this with push, pull or slide in some way. And there are of course, a lot of different uh, options here. I'm going to only give you just a few examples. Um, resilient floor mats for people who have to engage in prolonged standing postures. The use of carts so that we don't have to actually uh, carry things for any real distance. We instead are going to roll them around. Well, you can still have problems with these. I always think back to a workplace uh, that I was in where the employer complained to me that, boy, you know, the employees said they were, you know, they really didn't want to have to carry all this stuff. Could we give them carts? Well, we gave them carts, but they don't use them. So I said to the employer, come out in the field and let me show you why the carts aren't being used. The problem was the shop floor had a lot of, of uh, indentations and cracks, crevices. It had a lot of damage. The carts that had been supplied to these people had very small wheels. So if you tried to roll this cart across the floor, those little wheels would stick uh, in all the damaged flooring. And of course, people would pull their backs trying to dislodge the cart because it would get stuck. You can imagine what that was like. So I said to the employer, here are your options. You can either fix the floor so these carts are usable, or you give people carts with very big wheels so they roll over the, the problems on the flooring. But this is the reason why people don't use them. And you know, when you think about carts, good versus bad designs are out there as well. And we want people to put the uh, sort of heavier items on this uh, shelf that's at the mid body range and lighter little things on the shelf that just above the wheels. That way, the lifts are as ergonomically sensible as possible. People don't have to do a lot of squatting, which they often don't do very well because they bend their backs instead to get down to lower levels. We have lift tables that literally respond to the weight placed on them so that the material is always kept at a nice height for the user. We have conveyor belts. This could be powered or not. For example, uh, in my little drawing there, I'm showing you a simple roller belt. And sometimes that's all that's needed to pass an item down to the next workstation. And that way you don't have people necessarily uh, exposed to um, uh, drive rollers and belts that can actually catch their clothing quite more easily. Uh, but you do have a way to get things shifted uh, along a distance or to enable someone to sort things much more easily. And to keep in mind that sometimes a conveyor belt can be a temporary solution. 
For example, let's say that you're moving from one building to another or you're reorganizing people within a workplace, you might just want to rent, rent some conveyor belts and use them temporarily to solve simple problems. Forklifts are often uh, the big answer and there are lots of different designs and materials handling equipment that enables this to be done well, as well as good designs for forklifts that aren't necessarily forks. Sometimes they're big clamps to, get, uh, to uh, grab bundles of things. There are lots of neat designs here. Now, in the lower left of figure, I'm showing you an example of a sit stand. Sometimes where people have to do prolonged standing, being able to take a little bit of the weight off is helpful. This is not actually a stool. The seat is not big enough for you to actually sit on. It sort of catches the end of your rear end and lets you take a little bit of the weight off and kind of shift your body position around, giving muscles a chance to get changes in blood flow. And of course, there are indeed tools and equipment where design changes have made a huge difference. A big one has been ability to design out vibration transfer to the handles of a piece of equipment, as well as, of course, ways we put bends in the equipment uh, or the tool and not bends in our wrists and hands and back and so on. Now, of course, further down the hierarchy, we might make use of administrative controls. And as always, we often need training. Sometimes we institute equipment in a workplace like safe patient handling equipment to lift patients uh, or to assist them to a standing position or whatever, but we still need to train people on how to use those pieces of equipment properly. We might put in place work practices such as lifting limits in which we say to people uh, at this level, you can lift the weight yourself, but anything above this, you have to go get a piece of equipment for that, or we put in place pairs or team lifting to do it. And of course, we train people on how to do pairs or teams lifting. And of course, job rotation is a possibility here too, where we rotate people around on a job so no one person does whatever the physically demanding task happens to be. Now, this has a tremendous advantage, yes, People get to use different muscles and not wear out certain muscle groups a lot. Uh, it also gives people a chance to cross train and enable them to fill in for each other when they need to. But uh, it can be also a temporary solution. Maybe you are buying uh, good pieces of, uh, of equipment with better design to use in the next uh, year, uh, but you can't use it right now. You can't afford it. So you do some job rotation in the interim until, of course, you can bring that equipment in in your next budget year. Now, personal protective equipment in the ergonomic area is actually rather limited. There are some actual engineering controls that enable people to wear full body skeletons, uh, exoskeletons, literally, to do work, but those would be much higher up on the hierarchy. But when it comes to putting PPE on people, things like padded or gel-filled gloves can help a lot in dealing with the gripping of a tool uh, or in restricting the vibration transfer from the tool to the hand. But you'll notice I'm saying not back belts. Back belts are really in intended for rehabilitation. Now, some workplaces say yes, but if a person don a back, dons a back belt, they're, they're more careful about how they position their body. Well, the reality is uh, NIOSH has done a number of studies on these and they say, you know, Back belts are really not uh, a preventive uh, tool. They're really there for rehabilitation. Okay, what about the field of chemicals? Well, here we've seen a lot of interesting creativity taking place. So let's take a look at some possibilities here. Now, sometimes we can do a lot of creativity in the area of product or process substitution. And that sometimes has become so important for people, especially because it has some other potential uh, outfall to it, such as uh, assistance in the environmental area of chemical use as well. So I'd like to get people thinking about ideas here, ways that you might use a less hazardous material or a different process so I'll show you some examples of that. But also there has been some recent trends in source reduction ideas. And here, uh, what I like to uh, point out uh, is uh, that um, when you think about uh, uh, the use of chemicals and their environmental fate, 
uh, we have ideas coming out of all kinds here. There's been a huge growth in the area of green chemistry. And you might uh, take a look at the American Chemical Society's website, as well as just search on the expression green chemistry. And you'd be surprised at the amazing uh, advances that have been done here. Uh, among those, of course, are areas that we think of as green cleaning, where we have alternative uh, formulations for products uh, that, again, have great uh, environmental application here, too. And some of those have involved the form uh, in which we have changed the product. The way, for example, that instead of buying a, 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 a textile or laundry detergent uh, as a solution, which involves the shipping of a lot of water and liquid around in the process, we have dehydrated laundry products available as little tear-off sheets of dehydrated detergent, uh, and of course, uh, consolidated um, uh, pillows of compressed powders as well that can be used here. A lot of interest in toxics use reduction generally, and you might search on that term and get some great ideas too. Now, of course, some places have gone to very structured approaches to this, looking at a true life cycle analysis of a product from its manufacturing and raw materials uh, used for it, and even the mining of those, uh, all the way through to the effects on the environment for disposal, spills, how this part is used and goes down a drain, and so on. And that kind of analysis has pushed people through some uh, nice alternatives. And similarly, the idea of cradle to cradle certification, that when we use chemicals uh, in a workplace, the reality is that they don't really go to a grave. They just go somewhere else. And uh, if we look at that, and again, it's a lot, another I, uh, idea and view of life cycle approach, uh, we can get uh, some great ideas here on how we might reduce chemical exposures. Now, some ideas for product or product substitution. If you're trying to reduce the physical hazards of a chemical, it's reactive problems like flammability and so forth. You might try switching from something solvent-based to something water-based. You might be able to reduce the strength of an oxidizer or reducer so that it's less aggressive in the form that people actually use it. Maybe weaker solutions of corrosives. Sometimes people have actually gone all the way to a solution becoming instead an irritant and not a corrosive anymore because we push the pH towards neutrality so far. And we might simply say certain categories of reactivity, we simply will uh, avoid. We're going to find alternatives for these. So we avoid a lot of products that have various instabilities or that might have explosive water reactive peroxidizable problems associated with them. To reduce the health hazard side of chemicals, we might make choices that decrease the vapor pressure. Now, of course, this means that if a product has to evaporate to be used, it's going to take a little longer time to dry, but the exposure the person faces while using it becomes a lot lower at any one time. We might make cho choices which increase the dosage needed for toxicity so that the material moves more and more towards the non-toxic range. Remember, a material is very dangerous if a very low dosage is poisonous. If we're moving towards a larger dosage to be poisonous, then the product becomes safer. You might very well compare inhalation hazards using a technique called vapor hazard ratio. I don't have time in today's program to talk about that, but if you're interested, let me know and we can focus in on chemical hazards specifically and I can show you how to use that. And again, weaker solutions of corrosives can reduce the risks of burns and not just the risk of damage to surfaces. Now, when you think about elimination and substitution, depending on what is the hazard you're trying to actually resolve, this could be an elimination uh, idea or it could be a substitution idea. So imagine you're trying to put down new carpet in your facility. You could replace a solvent-based adhesive with a water-based adhesive. And that reduces not only the exposure of the installers, but of course, the kinds of off gas you get with new materials when people move into that space where the new carpet has been put down. Now, other alternatives might in involve uh, total changes of the process by which we install carpet, such as replacing the use of a, uh, an adhesive as a liquid with something like a peel and stick backing. 
Or maybe you could put down the carpet with mechanical fasteners, things like little metal strips with teeth on them that go uh, along the floor uh, next to the walls and the carpet is pulled over and pressed down onto the mechanical fastener. Sometimes the insulation with those takes a little bit longer, but um, it involves a lot of change in potential chemical exposure here. And of course, there are carpet squares which use friction backing. And some people swear by these because if they become damaged or stained, they are much easier to replace a square uh, of a, a piece of carpet than have to, of course, replace a whole room. Now, of course, what if you are trying to eliminate or substitute around the various problems of a product you've been using for years to degrease metal parts? All right, let's take you through the thought process of doing that. I've had to do this so many different times for different types of products, and I wanna give you an idea of some of the options out there and the creativity that can sometimes get involved here. Well, in this particular workplace, we have people working with the solvent 111 trichloroethane, which of course affects the nervous system, the liver and kidneys adversely. And over time, we found it to be a liver carcinogen too. Well, what if the metals and the, uh, 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 that you're working with and the various nature of the parts themselves dictate that you need to stay with a solvent of some kind? Well, we have some options here. Or we could perhaps go to something water-based. Hmm, that opens up some options. Or maybe we could do some mechanical cleaning. And maybe some of the mechanical materials we're actually going to be using are the waste from some other industry. And wow, do we look a lot greener here? Well, let's look at what this might involve. Let's say the process is one in which the metals we're working with and the nature of the parts means we have to stay with the solvent. So we want to get away from the hazards of trichloroethane. Well, trichloroethane is extremely difficult to ignite. It's not, strictly speaking, truly non-flammable. It's ignitable, but not very easily. So if your workplace is one which has not been habituated to addressing issues of flammability before, the substitute you pick is now going to be something that has some type of fire hazard associated with it. Things like switching to xylene drops the vapor pressure a lot, but you still have flammability. Well, hmm, maybe you'd like to get away from an aromatic solvent altogether and the health hazards associated with it. Okay, well, how about going to some kind of aliphatic naphtha? Not aromatic naphtha, which still contains perhaps some benzene residuals and other aromatics, but is truly not having any rings like that at all. Well, this is a version of mineral spirits, um, but it's poorly refined and its uh, composition is kind of the general, has a lot of different components to it. Some people like to go to something a little bit more defined than that. Now you could go to st a stoddard solvent, a very highly refined mineral spirits. Move the potential carcinogens, strips down the ingredient range a lot, and it is possible to actually go uh, to a high flash stoddard solvent, which puts it over well into the combustible range with a flash point of 140 Fahrenheit, rather than something around 103 to 105. Now, if you decide to go to something called isopar, this is again a paraffinic mineral spirits, but it has only two major ingredients, and again, very well-defined composition, very well-understood properties. Now, what if the metals and parts themselves can indeed be cleaned in a water-based solution? What would that be like? Well, you could go to a solution based on terpenes. Terpenes are extracted from the white rind of citrus fruits, usually oranges, but not exclusively. And uh, these are very, very powerful degreasers. You can get hand cleaners, for example, based on orange oil, and it works very well. Now, these are typically sold in a solution that is slightly alkaline, and that may or may not be a pH issue for your metals. Now, you could uh, use an alkali with a surfactant, in other words, a detergent added to it, with or without a heated tank. Hmm, that might be a possibility. Or maybe the metal needs an acid cleaning instead, combined perhaps with a surfactant to help the, uh, the uh, uh, material stay well um, uh, uh, emulsified in the water, well suspended so they will rinse well, again, with or without a heated tank to assist it. Maybe you can use a high pressure alkaline cleaner. 
and use the pressure to do further cleaning. Maybe you could get by with a totally aqueous surfactant solution, often heated, but maybe with the assistance of an ultrasonic cleaner. Just keep in mind, if you're gonna use any type of surfactants or those detergents, you'd like to get away from the nonyl phenylethoxylates, which are unfortunately endocrine disruptors uh, when they go down a wastewater treatment plant and get partly broken down by the bacteria. That sends the endocrine disrupting product out into our receiving body, body of water. Maybe you could even tumble those parts in a mechanical cleaning process. Now, of course, if they're delicate, that may not be an option, but this may be a possibility for you. You turn the parts in a drum and the materials, again, uh, pick up the uh, resulting oil or whatever residue is on your parts, uh, and then you clean the resulting materials in some fashion or dispose them in some way. Sometimes you can tumble the parts with metal shot that can remove a lot of corrosion on those parts, and then you collect the resulting material from that. Again, these have uh, dust associated with them because you're collecting the little bits of metal corrosion that were chipped off uh, by the metal shot, but the metal shot can be then uh, cleaned and reused and sent back through your process. Some people have been using the waste from other industries, waste nutshells, waste corn cobs for this process, and the resulting oil, uh, if that's what you're cleaning off, is absorbed uh, by the nutshells or corn cobs, and the material then has the advantage of later being able to be burned and then used as a fuel, and you can recover those calories, heating a boiler or generating electricity. Now, of course, with chemicals, we have all kinds of engineering controls here. Equipment to des de and design can encapsulate a process. We might look at a workflow uh, and improve that. We might put up barriers, uh, machine guards, splash guards, do total enclosures of processes. We might uh, be able to mechanize a process and maybe partly uh, use a robot for some of it. We might uh, be able to uh, have a process so thoroughly enclosed or people separated from the process in a control room and do remote observation, remote monitoring, monitoring, for example, with warnings, alarms, and automatic interlocks, which shut down a process or close down an ignition source or whatever. But in other words, it's not just an alarm, which someone then has to go out and do something. That drops down the hierarchy to the administrative level. You could install local exhaust ventilation, special ventilation perhaps, that is explosion proof or corrosion proof. Uh, we could of course use general dilution ventilation if local exhaust is not really needed. Uh, we also wanna make sure that where we have people exposed to chemicals, we have provision for them to have eye washes and showers. And of course with engineering controls, we have the ability to add in things like rehabilitation technology, structural accommodations, assistive technology. And in fact, find it not only helps people with disabilities, but may improve the, the uh, productivity of everybody else too. And of course, ventilation design becomes important. Where does the air come and, grow and go? I've been into many workplaces where people did not think about where the air was coming and going. And I see a lot of the upper left uh, figure where people are saying to me, well, we've got the worker working in front of an open window. Yes, but the fresh air comes in, picks up the contaminant and blows it in the person's face. No, what you want to put in that window is an exhaust fan, such as you see uh, in the uh, lower figures where the fresh air comes from somewhere else. Then the, it reaches the person first, picks up the contaminant and then is removed to the outside. Sometimes our improvements actually save us energy. You know, if you enclose a process that you're going to uh, use exhaust ventilation for, it's amazing how you can, in fact, decrease the size of a fan, use smaller size equipment, and use less electricity, as well as improving the efficiency of capture of whatever the contaminants might be. Often directing the airflow is exactly what we need to do to capture that contaminant right at its source. That's why when I see people working with ventilation on the right that's overhead, pulling the contaminant past the person's face before it's vented to the outside. Wow, is that not a good protection for that person? And at the same time, you're capturing so much other room air and exhausting it at the same time. What a waste of energy. 
Now, of course, if you're working in a situation where you need to have a lab hood, it actually employs both of these principles, both enclosure and direction. For example, on the left is the way hoods were first uh, designed. They simply had exhaust out the top. Notice what happens when the sash is open. What happens actually to the air? Notice that some of that air actually kicks back out at the person standing in front. Now, with better designs, we put in baffles and we direct the airflow both up and to the back. Notice the dramatic difference here. That means when the sash is open, all of the air from the outside is directed inwards. The person standing in front of that opening is very well protected. But of course, you know, some people don't realize what's going on here. They try to store things in the hood and block that lower back baffle, or they so load up the, the hood with equipment that again, it blocks that lower back baffle. And the result is <laughs> they simply move back in time to the earlier hood uh, design and in fact are defeating the whole purpose of having good hood design. Now, when it comes to good designs of ventilation, this is something that we employ to great effect in confined space work, but we always have to make sure of where the gear again is coming and going so that we have good air turnover in that space. We avoid short circuiting, we make sure that the air is turned over so efficiently. And of course, with good air testing, we can tell whether ventilation has worked well or not. Now, the last line of defense, of course, is personal protective equipment. Now here, I'm only going to cover a few basic ideas about this, but remember, again, the common mistakes that people make with PPE. If you're selecting gloves, boots, any kind of protective clothing, we have to pay attention to two major factors here. One of them is the degradation rating. And what's meant by this is, the material your protective clothing is made from has to be able to tolerate the chemical of interest here. We don't want the chemical to uh, make the uh, uh, protective uh, clothing become gooey, cracked, uh, begin, become brittle and break. Um, we have a workplace, as I assure you, I've dealt with some of them, where people will say, oh, yes, the employer gives me as many gloves as I can use. And that's important because, you know, the gloves break down uh, through the day and I have to keep throwing them out. Oh, my goodness. Yes, you've picked the wrong glove material. That's why you have to make sure it's always a compatibility issue. Now, we also have to go one step further than this. Notice on this particular chart, the neoprene is recommended for this particular chemical of ethyl alcohol. All right, let's look at different kinds of neoprene gloves because we also need to consider what's called breakthrough time. And you wanna ask your manufacturer of your protective clothing, what is the breakthrough time for your product for the chemical I need to use it for? Now breakthrough time means that chemicals over time can begin to migrate through the glove to the inside and reach your skin. That means you need to have a good enough breakthrough time to hold up for the time the person is gonna be wearing this gear. And notice for these different neoprene gloves, the actual length of time the person is protected can vary enormously. Now, when it comes to protection for the eyes, I always like to remind people, your best protection really is unvented goggles because unvented goggles protect you from gases and vapors, as well as some very fine airborne dust, and that includes fine airborne particulate, including microorganisms. Now, of course, <laughs> if you're a person who's worn unvented goggles, I'm sure your complaint is going to be, but they fog up all the time. Well, that's where you want to employ an anti-fog. Anti-fog is common, both wipes and sprays, so that you can apply them to the inside of your goggles and you could be working over steam and not have these things fog up. Now, when choosing protection, keep in mind that a face shield is face protection. It's not eye protection.
People can often be dismayed when I remind them of that, but keep in mind, airborne materials go around face shields. <clears throat> so if you actually need eye protection, you're going to have goggles underneath that face shield, or you can buy a combination goggle face shield where it's all in one, and you can look like an Avenger superhero of some kind. Now, of course, face shields uh, can be attached uh, to helmets and hard hats, uh, or they can be uh, worn, of course, uh, uh, separately. And naturally, if our route of entry is respiratory protection, we fall back on respirators. I'm showing one illustration here for you, but these, of course, involve very uh, specific uh, attention to the nature of your chemical exposure, uh, its chemical form, uh, its type, uh, and uh, the level of exposure, because the selection process here uh, is uh, not uh, necessarily a simple one. It can, in fact, be quite elaborate. Now, the last category I want to share with you briefly is what we're dealing with currently when we think about biological hazards. For example, when you think about bloodborne pathogens, we have employed, of course, vaccination to try to eliminate hazards as much as possible the way we have vaccines for hepatitis B virus or for Ebola virus. We've employed engineering controls. Some examples would be puncture resistant containers for our used needles and sharps or one use needle designs. We've employed work practices in the administrative level, such as universal precautions, where we say, assume anyone could be infected and use the same precautions for everybody. We employ hand washing, we can forbid the recapping of needles except with a special one-handed technique with a device to help us. And of course, we use all kinds of PPE depending upon the nature of our job. But when it comes to an airborne disease like we're dealing with currently uh, with um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and what we have been dealing with over the years with various forms of influenza, TB and other diseases, can we do elimination here? And a lot of the question of course I raise here is to what level of effectiveness? Can people do remote work or use virtual technology? Can we be uh, having policies like signs and building entrances that instruct people if they have symptoms or an illness that's respiratory in nature, not to report to work or enter the facility? We engage in quarantine and isolation protocols of all kinds. We put in place vaccination mandates and keep good records and documentation of those. And we screen people, employees and visitors to our workplaces for disease. But these, all of them on this list have their limits to how perfect they can be. So elimination is not as easy as it sounds. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, substitution, I can't really do for you. I can't give you a replacement like, a, oh, I'll just exchange SARS-CoV-2 for one of the other coronaviruses that causes the common cold. Well, I can't do that for you. So we drop down to engineering controls. We explore improvements to ventilation. We use guidance from organizations like ASHRAE or the International Well Building Standard or OSHA. And I think a lot of this guidance is probably going to be here to stay in remodeling, renovation, and upgrades to ventilation systems and buildings. <laughs> We can, of course, increase our fresh air supply and our dilution. We can disable demand controlled ventilation. And of course, if we reduce occupancy levels in our building as well, we increase the effective dilution ventilation per person just by doing that. We can upgrade the air filtration, particularly filtration that handles any kind of recirculated air in a building. And of course, open windows and doors where that's a possibility. And when you think about improvements to ventilation and how effective they can be, we want to make sure we have a large number of air changes per hour. Notice, if you want to reduce risk, we have to really go up to six or more air changes per hour to reduce risk as significantly as actually putting a respirator on someone. And this is where we raise some clear trade-offs and certainly people would love to not have to wear uh, any type uh, of respiratory protection if that can be avoided. We take a look at designs of our uh, air handling equipment and keep in mind that a lot of times we may very well take a look at changing designs here. 
as well. Some people have uh, introduced engineering controls like UV germicidal irradiation. And this one can be very effective in killing um, uh, airborne organisms uh, and viruses by doing serious genetic damage to them, preventing the potential for them to replicate um, in the future, whether of course they're able to do that on their own or uh, like viruses invade living cells and reproduce effectively there. Now, some places have gone to UV dis disinfection at night because remember, you can't shine UV disinfection directly down on people. It's obviously a carcinogen and can do a vision damage uh, as well. Some people have uh, put the uh, UV disinfection in the upper room air. So it uh, has baffles in it so that it's only directed sideways uh, and uh, people looking up at, uh, uh, at the um, uh, bulbs and so forth can't actually see them. They can't actually get exposure. And some people have gone to UV lamps installed into ductwork. Nellie? Well, of course, yes? I have a question from Cynthia, or she's, uh, yeah, she's asking a question. She's saying, my office has installed air purifiers throughout their office space. Is that helpful, protective? And several people are asking, when is the webinar over with? Oh, um, I only have a couple more slides. It's about to end. I'm sorry, yeah, I have run over a little bit. I didn't notice the clock, uh, my fault, but only a couple more minutes here. So um, when it comes to adding um, air purifiers, uh, if they actually have filtration down to HEPA, a high efficiency particulate air filtration, and if they can turn over uh, the air sufficiently uh, for um, the size of the room they're in. So they have to be, in other words, purchased to be sized appropriately for that room. They can be amazing in what they do. But for example, when they've been used in uh, classrooms, they can literally um, uh, drop down um, the uh, airborne level of virus uh, by uh, 90 to 95%. Uh, and literally do that within 30 minutes. So yes, we have seen some remarkable effectiveness and uh, they can be used uh, uh, very effectively to augment uh, your uh, general ventilation uh, if your system simply can't be upgraded any further, especially if it's old or a bit undersized. Uh, these uh, room size units have been very, very helpful. Now, of course, um, uh, going down the hierarchy to our administrative controls, but we ask people to use hand hygiene, cough etiquette. We make tissues and sanitizer available. Uh, we put in place protocols for cleaning frequently touched surfaces. And believe it or not, that also helps reduce um, diseases spread through commonly touched surfaces, which is of course the case with um, a lot of our flu and a lot of our gastrointestinal illnesses that are spread that way. And of course, our last line of defense is using good personal protective equipment, which I would say to you for an airborne disease, your best is a respirator, meaning an N95 or higher level of respiratory protection. When properly fitted, these can block over 99% of viruses, even though they claim to do 95% at the 0.3 micron size level. And that's because these, uh, these respirators actually uh, inhibit uh, particulates entering the mask by four different methods not just by acting as a crude filter. They actually attract um, particulates with electrostatic action uh, and uh, vibrating particles that uh, uh, are very tiny. So literally, uh, they uh, actually remove things that are smaller than three-tenths of a micron and larger than three-tenths of a micron. But at three-tenths of a micron is where those four methods of capture actually have the lowest efficiency. Now, if you're wearing one, but you've never actually be fit, been fed tested for it, its performance is going to be probably less uh, than that. Uh, you're probably a lot closer to about 66%, um, uh, which is about the performance you get for a surgical mask uh, that, uh, that is uh, tightly fitting. So it's you know, a trade-off here. Uh, just be aware of having them produce uh, too tight a fit um, with the uh, straps. Now, the reason why I say this is a respirator is because it has a very tight seal around its outer edge. It has a conformable nose piece that you can bend to conform to your own nose. And it has two straps which go around the back of the head. It is not a respirator if it has ear loops, okay? 
So uh, that's uh, what I came uh, to, uh, to tell you here. So um, if anyone uh, wants to uh, ask further questions, I can stick around for a little while. But I'd like to say thank you for those who've uh, been with me um, to this point. Um, I do appreciate having uh, your attention to our uh, health and safety series and hope you'll join us for our future offerings as well. Uh, and of course, you can contact me at my email at njb7 at cornell.edu. Uh, if you put my name, Ellie Brown, uh, into Cornell's website, you'll get uh, connection information uh, to me as well. Um, so, uh, anyone uh, have any further questions? Mm -hmm. What is the difference between N95, K95, and KN95? Okay. Um, N95s uh, are um, uh, certified uh, by um, NIOSH. And what that means is the manufacturer has tested their respirators using the NIOSH required uh, certification tests and they meet those criteria. That enables the manufacturer to put NIOSH uh, on their uh, uh, respirator now, 95, as was saying, uh, means that the respirator uh, removes 95% of particulates at the three-tenths of a micron diameter size. It does better uh, at particles both lower, uh, and smaller in size and larger by doing four different methods of actual capture. Now, the N means that the um, respirator cannot be used in an atmosphere containing oil droplets. Uh, instead, uh, if you have an atmosphere where you're dealing with uh, oil-based droplets like uh, paints or metalworking fluids, whatever that are oil-based, then you want either an R95 or a P95. Uh, R is oil resistant and uh, is oil proof. Both of those, however, are only good to be worn really for one shift, then they need to be disposed of. Uh, N95s can be used for uh, water-based uh, aerosols and droplets of any kind, as well as dry particulates and dusts. Uh, and uh, they're very good for things like mold spores, uh, viruses, and so on. They're amazing. But again, their performance is best when they've been properly fit tested uh, because they are indeed uh, respirators. They're not face masks. Now, the K uh, N95s uh, are not um, NIOSH approved. Uh, they uh, meet uh, the uh, Chinese standard. Uh, and as a result, uh, they have ear loops. Uh, I can't guarantee for you uh, how well they're necessarily going to fit. Um, I know throughout the pandemic, I've seen a lot of, um, uh, of um, uh, postings go back and forth among fellow uh, industrial hygienists about how they have tried when they had a shortage of N95s to see if they could fit test some KN95s because they were able to get some and had some. And they had uh, nothing but failures of fit testing. And that's because ear loops do not produce the kind of facial seal that you can get with straps around the back of the head. That's why a respirator by definition has to have the straps around the back of the head uh, it's, if it's um, an air purifying respirator. So, that's kind of the distinction here. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Well, certainly if you're in the market for buying N95s, I would pay very close attention to the recommendations on NIOSH's website. They have seen a lot of manufacturers out there falsely claiming they make N95s and um, so there's been a lot of alerts and there's a, a NIOSH fact sheet on how to recognize a uh, real versus a counterfeit N95. Although my personal favorite was the picture of a counterfeit um, N95, uh, which had uh, NOSH on it instead of NIOSH, the I was missing. I got such a laugh out of that one. Um, so yeah, people are out there trying crazy stuff. So. Hopefully, see you all um, at a future um, uh, one of our series. 
Uh, and uh, if you think you would like to see uh, me do other uh, programs, other topics, do let me know. Uh, happy to help you out on that and see what we can come up with. So thank you very much for giving me your attention today and hopefully see you at a future program. So I'm going to sign off and say, say stay self safe and healthy. Bye-bye.